It's time to move beyond the topic of marriage. And we're going to pick up our study today, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 8. By the way, for a few of you gals that are bothered by it, I know that I need a haircut. And uh, <coughs> I know some of you, I think it annoys Kate. <coughs> and uh, so I know I need a haircut, so just, you know, get off my case, man. <laughs> leave, leave me alone. <laughs> I get in these seasons where I just, my wife's like, hon, it's time. I know, I know. <clears throat> First Peter chapter three, let's go ahead and pray together and let's get into this. Father in heaven, we just want to commit this time to you, Lord. Lord, this is all about you. And Lord, we need you more now than we've ever needed you before. As we're watching things unfold in the earth, we know that there is a massive preparation going on. <clears throat> we know that you're setting things up. Pieces of the puzzle are falling into place. Prophecy is being fulfilled. We know that we are at least 2,000 years closer to the end than the apostles were. And so, Lord, we're asking you to ready our hearts. Lord, help us to gird up the loins of our minds to be sober and to hope to the end <clears throat> for the grace that is to be brought unto us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We ask, God, that you would please allow these times, these moments, just like this to build us up. So many things want to divide our attention. We are more connected to a variety of things than we've ever been connected to before and yet we are so disconnected at the same time. So Lord, while we are here in the privacy of this room, in the quietness of this room, here amongst your people, Lord, we ask that you would please cause your face to look down upon us today and bless us, Lord. <clears throat> bless us with your presence. Bless us, Lord, with an understanding as we look into your word, as we dissect word definitions and as we attempt to walk through the text verse by verse, Lord, and, and have it explained I pray, Father, that you would please just give us the mind of Christ, give us willing hearts, willing to obey. We may fall so miserably short, Lord, but God, we pray for a willingness to obey, a desire, Lord, to be so tethered to you, so connected to you, Lord, that we just want to please you. So Lord, meet us here in this time. Right now, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> it was a little cloudy out there today, isn't it? Hey, Stephen, you want to go ahead and turn the light on, this, this main light? We usually leave it off during the worship, and I think we just forgot to turn it back on <clears throat> so you guys can read your Bible to make sure. <clears throat> I'm not trying to pull a fast one on you. You know what I mean? <laughs> Got to be able to see your Bibles, right? <laughs> so, Verse 8, here we go. <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and read through this section consisting of verses 8 through 12. <clears throat> to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life to love and to see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous 
and his ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Well, <clears throat> there certainly is a lot there. <clears throat> let's go ahead and back up to verse eight, and let's walk through this, especially in verse eight. We're kind of gonna be walking through this word by word. <laughs> So, verse 8 begins with the phrase, to sum up. To sum up, or it could be read, finally, or in summary. Now, this phrase obviously does not mark, <coughs> pardon me, mark an end to the epistle, but rather is marking a winding down of things in the last few sections. It's coming to a conclusion based upon a series of, of exhortations that we have just gone through. And this series of exhortations began with an appeal for behavior that is becoming conduct for a Christian fitted to silence a hostile world. Our Christian witness is not to appease the world <clears throat> and make them like us, but to exhibit Christ-like character that is beyond reproach. That's the key. And then what follows here is a list of five social virtues which specify how Christians are to relate to one another. They constitute an ideal portrait of the church. And these virtues were not chosen at random. They're very specific. So the next part of the verse says, <clears throat> all of you be, and here's the list. Number one, harmonious, harmonious. Now, the only occurrence of this word in the New Testament in its plural form, as is the case here, is in 1 Peter 3.8. This is it. It means of one mind, which in this sense means united in heart and affections. Now, Peter's exhortation does not mean that there will be no differences of opinion. Rather, believers are to focus on the purposes which transcend minor differences of opinion and thus serve to unite. I mean, precisely because differences of opinion <clears throat> on some things are inevitable, the Bible urges Christians to maintain harmony. Obviously, the Holy Spirit knew there'd be differences of opinion. But there's something, there's a core value, <clears throat> there are core values that we have to agree upon, we have to be harmonious about. Warren Wiersbe in his commentary said, unity does not mean uniformity. It means cooperation in the midst of diversity. The members of the body work together in unity even though they are different. Christians may differ on how things are to be done, but they must agree on what is to be done and why, end quote. And that's true. So Christians should be like-minded because they have a common source to instruct the mind and that common source is the word of God. The emphasis is on an agreement reached by all receiving the truth of God through his word. The priority, therefore, is to know the mind of Christ rather than take a straw poll from a diversity of human minds. And you know what can hap happen when you do that. <clears throat> so we rally around the rallying point, the word of God, and we're trying to understand that together because we know that's the truth. We know that's the right thing. Listen to this quote. <clears throat> Please excuse me. I am <clears throat> definitely challenged today <clears throat> with this weather. The moist weather does this to me. Here's what one, one writer said. Peter himself had been told by the Lord that he did not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men in Matthew 16, 23. He had taken the Lord aside and told him, <clears throat> excuse me, that he was not to do 
his father's will, that he, Peter, would not allow him to suffer and die. The word for mind in the Lord's reply is the same <clears throat> as the word harmony here. It's in the same <clears throat> etymology. It's in the same word group as the word here, not in the plural. I have no doubt Peter had this in his thoughts as he wrote these words. It was certainly important for these first century believers to know that their aims and purposes were in harmony as they faced persecution together, end quote. So in other words, we've got to know what the right thing to believe is so that we can rally around that as we're fighting opposition to the Christian faith. Amen? That has to be there. And so we need to make sure that we heed that one little word. Next thing on the list there, <clears throat> we are told to be sympathetic. To be sympathetic here basically means sharing fellow feelings, whether those feelings be joyous or whether those feelings be sorrowful. It connotes here that readiness to enter into and share in the feelings of others that enables one to rejoice with them that rejoice as well as weep with them that weep, Romans 12, 5. And of course, we think about Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So we're bearing each other's burdens. And of course, there's also 1 Corinthians 12, 26 which says that if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And so the need for mutual compassion is unending since we ourselves will always need it in one way or another. And that is precisely what Christ does for us. For he has had similar experiences. Think about Hebrews 4.15, which says that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need, because we have a Savior who understands our weakness because he himself endured the same kind of weakness, obviously without sin, which is the amazing thing for us to even try to comprehend the fact that he was able to endure it <clears throat> without ever sinning. So <clears throat> we are to be sympathetic, but, and by the way, this is why we can be sympathetic toward the brethren, toward each other, because we're all in this together. We all get, we all take our lumps and we're all in need of each other, prayer for, uh, from each other, for each other, uh, rallying around each other. You get it, right? Also, it says there, one singular word, we are to be brotherly. Now, this word is actually transliterated, <laughs> Philadelphia, not quite Philadelphia, but close, and it does indeed mean brotherly love. Now, it surely refers to the love that believers should have for one another. This is the love that Christ required of his disciples. Now, in secular Greek, the term was used of the love of physical brothers and sisters. But in Christian usage, in Christian literature, that word, that phrase, <clears throat> brotherly love, is always used in a figurative sense, denoting the mutual love, which is the bond of brotherhood in Christ, not of this sort of all-embracing brotherly love. You know, the ideal of the universal brotherhood of man is admittedly desirable, but practically beyond achievement without the impartation of this brotherly love and the new birth. The world likes to rally around, we are the world, right? It's like, yeah, we all love each other. And that's such a pseudo kind of a love compared to this. Because this love can only be experienced because of rebirth. 
That's what brings, that's what gives this love teeth that enables it to be able to bind people together, bring people together in the truest possible sense. The world seeks this out, but never achieves it. Try as they may, and they do try. Some do, anyway. Some try, but they can't. They can't achieve this. And as I said earlier, <clears throat> the practice of this kind of brotherly affection is the sign that we have passed from death into life. And the badge of true Christian discipleship is that badge that now I love the brothers, my brothers in Christ, my brothers and sisters in Christ. First John states it in numerous places, this is how you know that you have new life because you love those who also have it. You love the people of God. You love to be around them. Folks, if you don't really like being around the people of God, something's wrong, right? Something's wrong. There's something out of balance there. So we want to remember that. John Calvin remarked, where God is known as a father, there and only there, brotherhood really exists. And that is true. We read it back in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. End quote. Next on the list, single word, it says, kind-hearted, kind-hearted. Also, could be translated as tender-hearted. That's one of the definitions of it, tender-hearted, or compassionate. Now, compassionate or kind-heartedness, <clears throat> this word occurs also in Ephesians 4.32, and it depicts a warm and tender attitude, an affectionate sensitivity toward the needs of others. The word here as an adjective is derived from another word, from the noun, referring to the internal organs, the heart, the lungs, the liver, which were thought of as the seat of emotions. When the Bible uses a term like that, it, it actually goes beyond just Heart, it means all the innards. <laughs> and it's actually comparable to our English term heart. Yes, it's comparable to that, but it's also comparable to the English word bowels, the deepest part of us. Now, in the Septuagint, uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament, and the New Testament, the word denotes the deepest human emotions, especially love, pity, and compassion. In the Synoptic Gospels, the verb is generally used of Jesus himself in the sense of being deeply touched. We read that, that Jesus was moved with compassion, moved with compassionate tenderness. And by the way, I, I, I reference a lot as a word is used in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, it's a good idea to, when you're doing a word study to also include the Septuagint. You, you can get access to it on the internet. It's all over the place on the internet. And it's nice to see how the word, if it, if it was used in, in the Old Testament, it's nice to see how it was used there. You've got Old Testament Greek, and then you've got, <clears throat> you've got classical Greek, and you've got New Testament Greek, and these different types of Greek languages, <clears throat> different dialects of Greek. Uh, it's nice to see how it was used in the Old Testament because it helps you to understand the etymology of the word, how it was used a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago versus how it was used in the, in, when the writers of the New Testament wrote the New Testament. So that's why I reference the, uh, the Septuagint a lot, abbreviated as LXX, Roman numerals, LXX. But moved with compassion and tenderness is how Jesus was referenced and that, what I mentioned earlier, Ephesians 4.32, that verse says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, there it is, 
forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Next in the list here, the last thing in the list is humble in spirit. Now, this is derived from a word that's only used in this form here in the New Testament. And it is defined as such. Having a modest opinion of oneself. Lowly minded. The vitally important quality of humility is the recognition of our own weaknesses and limitations. It recognizes strengths too, but it knows that any strength that we may have comes from God. We are, we are a creature. We are not the creator. And we are utterly dependent on God. In ourselves, we can do nothing. I was speaking, about, speaking to a young man about this yesterday who felt like he wanted to be able to do more <clears throat> for himself by himself, you know, and he was wondering, is there any way to disconnect from my dependency on God because I just want to be able to, you know, get stuff done by myself? And I said, never, never, <laughs> can never happen. You always have to cleave to the Lord because without him, we are nothing. So our standard of comparison is God himself, and that's why we are humble. We are humbled about the abilities that we have, whatever talents we may have. And we may be talented. We may be good at a lot of stuff. And if we are, we can't take credit for any of it. Somebody might come up and thank us for this or that, and we're blessed to be able to bless them with whatever talent we have, right? It's, it's a, to, to us, it's just a service to them. We're glad to be able to serve them, but we can never take the glory for ourselves. And that's what creates this mindset of humility. We are humbled to be able to do anything that we do, <clears throat> and we count it a joy to be able to serve others with the abilities that we have. And so this humble person has no illusion about themselves. <clears throat> They're not enamored with themselves, and that's what humility is. Listen what this one writer said, quote, if the Romans rejected the idea of pity, then the Greeks could not understand humility. To them, it was a sign of weakness. One characteristic which has to be present in every believer is the recognition that whatever we have, whatever we have received, <clears throat> whatever we have received, we've received by the grace of God. We have no reason to set ourselves above a fellow believer. Our abysmal failure in the past and the frailty of our natural abilities in the present leave us no room for pride. However, we must be careful to avoid a false humility which is almost as objectionable. It is, a strange, but, it is strange but true that it is possible to be humble and proud of it. I am such a humble soul. <laughs> Thank you for that. Don't thank me, thank the Lord. And, and, and deep inside, it's like, I did do that, didn't I? And, and that, of course, is also a form of a lack of humility. Now, we're not going to exhaust, exhaust every thought on this subject now because this is actually going to come up again in chapter 5. Peter, later on, is going to underline the importance of humility by quoting from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. <clears throat> and it was another lesson that Peter had to learn the hard way. So, to summarize, like-mindedness, sympathy, brotherly love, compassion, and humility. How beautifully these five characteristics reflect the life and teaching of the Lord that we profess to follow. And Jesus said, you want to follow me? Do this. This is how you are to be. Oh, but the sentence continues. Verse nine. Not returning evil for evil. Insult for insult. But giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Now this is actually, this is essentially a paraphrase of what Jesus said in Matthew 5. But I say unto you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. 
Then he, later he said, but I say it to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now this is interesting here because Peter is actually showing us how Christians can get even. <laughs> okay? Speaking well of those who speak ill of us is very demanding. There are easier options for the carnally minded individual. There is the wide road that Jesus mentions, and we can choose to walk on that wide road. Again, I'm going to quote from Warren, Warren Wiersbe. I don't quote from him too much, but uh, <clears throat> Warren Wiersbe, it's almost a tongue twister for me, helpfully suggests that as a Christian, we can live on three levels. Listen to this we can return evil for good, which is the satanic level. We can return good for good, evil for evil, which is the human level. Or we can return good for evil, which is the divine level. Jesus is the perfect example of this latter approach. End quote. Now, Peter has already written that when they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. Remember back in chapter two, verse 23, when he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Again, that is not easy to do. Now, you'll notice here in verse nine that there are actually two levels of retaliation. We're looking at both retaliation in both deed and word. The word evil in this context is to be understood as something beyond just payback with words. Let's say that I, I notice the side of my car is scratched when I come out of the grocery store. There's blue paint in the scratch and the car next to mine is blue. I conclude they did it. How dare they be so inconsiderate? So I key the car, get in my car, and drive off, <laughs> okay? Evil for evil, right? Maybe they saw it and went, oh, oh well. Didn't leave a note in the car, he just went to the store. By returning evil for evil, anything that we regard as injurious <clears throat> to our own welfare and interests, evil is only increased and not restrained. It just allows evil to keep going. And the extent of the evil returned is measured by the size of the evil received. The natural tendency is to return the evil in full measure or perhaps more. Thus, evil is only multiplied. Remember, even when there was deserved punishment in the Old Testament, there was eye for eye, tooth for tooth, stripe for stripe. In other words, it was to match the crime, that's what it was supposed to do. We, we rarely make it even. We say, I'm gonna get even, but we don't really get even. <clears throat> we go beyond that. Here it's saying, don't do any of that. Don't even try to get even. To break this vicious chain, someone must voluntarily endure evil without retaliation. It's like, you know, the soft answer that turns away wrath. I remember many years ago, a brother in Christ, I don't know if he's here, I th I, he is here, I saw him earlier, <clears throat> but Paul Scrivener was the man that did this. He probably doesn't even remember this, but I remember one time we pulled up to this construction type thing and we were supposed to meet someone there early in the morning and, and we got there and we didn't see anybody and uh, we, we went up to the construction trailer and knocked on the door and knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked and finally somebody answered. They swung the door open and like, what? <laughs> Whoa. And, and Paul just had this big smile on his face and said, good morning, sir. And he just loved up on that guy and it completely disarmed the guy. <laughs> He felt so bad about what he had done. He was just like, oh, sorry. Uh, and immediately went into like this apologetic. And Paul, as we're walking into the building, he whispers under his breath to me, a soft answer turns away wrath. And I just went, amen, brother. It was very, very, it was very good. <laughs> and here, the next part of the verse, 
insult for insult, well, that brings the prohibition into the realm of speech. So now we go beyond keying the car to get back to verbal attack. Now, for the unregenerate nature, this prohibition is even harder to obey because an individual may have enough self-restraint not to resort to active violence, all right? But they may yield to the less violent urge to use retaliatory and abusive language against another who has injured them. And the believer is being told that they should refrain from all vengeance as being the prerogative of God alone. We just love to get someone back. Romans 12 says, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But look what it says in verse nine, the the rest of it there. Instead it says, but giving a blessing instead. So rather than rather than evil for evil, insult for insult, giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Now the word for blessing here actually means to seek a person's highest good. And believe it or not, the word is connected to the word, the etymology of the word, it's connected to the word eulogy. But eulogizing doesn't need to wait until the person is gone. Whatever people say of us, we must bless them because we wish the very best for them. That is what we wish is God's best for them. Now we may have no direct means by which we can bestow a blessing on them, but we can pray that God will do for them that which is outside of our power. And let us be reminded of the occasion when Stephen prayed for those who stoned him and he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. So he was blessing them as they were killing him. And a young Pharisee named Saul was one of those for whom Stephen prayed. And the Lord answered that prayer. Isn't that amazing? God blessed Saul that was cursing Stephen. The Christian should always be more concerned with mercy for others than he is with justice for himself. Let me repeat that. The Christian should always be more concerned with mercy for others than he is with justice for himself. One writer said, in Christ, God blesses those who have sinned against him. It is therefore an essential part of our Christian calling, of a Christian calling ourselves to experience the kind of treatment which we are here exhorted to give to those who sin against us. This is a real tough one, you guys. Or it can be. Peter reminds them, he reminds us, that this is behind the calling of every believer Notice the very last part of verse nine. It says, because to this you were called so that you might inherit a blessing. So they understood that in becoming Christians, they would have to act in this way and the fact that they were called confirms that their inheritance is secure. The use of the word inherit here indicates that this that they received, they received as a gift, not as a blessing that they had earned or deserved. And they might also remember that not every blessing which they are to inherit is in the future. A blessing bestowed on someone else can also bring immediate blessing to them. The experience of every believer in every generation who has practiced this precept confirms the truth of it. It is definitely more blessed to give than to receive. And when we are able to bless in this way when we're being insulted, it does something to our hearts. And it also lets the other person off the hook in a sense. So even in their severe trials, 
there are still greater blessings to be received and sometimes in unexpected ways. So they and we should remember that the world's view of good times is going to be very different to the view which God has. We know that many of Peter's readers were suffering greatly and we're gonna continue to suffer very greatly. The Acts of the Apostles provides some background to the pain which the first century Christians had to face. But who would doubt that Paul and Silas, for example, would look back on those days as nothing, than, uh, nothing other than good times. And so we have to understand that they're being told to do this in a context where hostility is just breathing out all over them. And we sort of feel that way as Christians in the United States today, don't we? I mean, we are, we are witnessing a kind of hostility in our culture right now toward Christian norms, Christian ideals. We're seeing a hostility that, I, I mean, I haven't seen since I've been a Christian. I've been a Christian 30, almost 35 years. And it's an amazing phenomenon. And the tendency is, you gotta really watch out, man. You got the, when you got the news on, you know, you're watching the news or you're reading whatever it is you read on the internet and it's just pushing that button in you and just making you mad. Oh, I just wanna go out swinging. Just give me something to swing at. And sometimes we don't even realize that we are victims of Satan himself. Our hearts are just overwhelmed by some of the things that we're looking at as we glance out over the horizon and God's just like Jesus told his disciples, yep, I'm sending you out into the midst of wolves. Be wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. So we're being called here to walk. We're being called here to walk in that. But Verses eight and nine are actually confirmed and substantiated by a quote from the Old Testament. Peter now is gonna provide some information on how it is we can enjoy good days. Look at verses 10 through 12 again. For the one who deserves life, excuse me, who desires life, Boy, that could have been a big typo, huh? <laughs> Yike! For the one who desires life to love and see good days, he must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it for the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer but the face of the Lord is, the, is against those who do evil. Now, the psalm here Obviously, this psalm, and this is a quotation, by the way, from Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. If you have a new a NASB, New American Standard, you can see that those three verses are all in caps. So that means that it's a quotation from the Old Testament. And this selection from Psalm 34, obviously, was not selected arbitrarily, since it addresses the issue faced by Peter's readers. The psalmist here reminded his readers that the Lord rescues his own when they suffer and that he, he, the Lord, will judge the wicked. Meanwhile, the righteous display their trust and their hope in the Lord by renouncing evil, it says, and pursuing what is good. Now, it's not difficult to see <clears throat> that the themes that are central in 1 Peter are evident in that particular psalm, which consists, it's a psalm about the suffering of God's people and encouragement for them when they are suffering. Their ultimate deliverance, the judgment of the wicked, the notion that a godly life is evidence of hoping in God, all of that are contained here and they're all contained in Psalm 34 as well. And these verses here sort of encapsulate what we find throughout Psalm 34. Psalm 34 is one of the most quoted psalms of encouragement that I have known since becoming a Christian over three decades ago. People read from Psalm 34, preach sermons from Psalm 34 all the time. If you've never read it, read Psalm 34. It's powerful. In the psalm, 
the life and the good days refers to earthly life and joys. Peter is using these terms not, in a lim- not limited to this life, but goes beyond it even to final salvation. It's not either or, it's both. If a person wants to live a good life now, Joel Osteen liked to say that, right? Your best life now. No, I'm not going there. I'm not going down that uh, trail of heresy. <clears throat> but if a person wants to live a good life now, and in the world to come, this is telling us they must shun evil and do good to all in order to receive that blessing. Verse 10 hits on the taming of the tongue. And we've had so many teachings on the taming of the tongue over the last year. The believer must refrain from every (coughs) evil of the tongue, whether it's slander, whether it's obscenity or lies. So much evil is expressed and so much pain is caused by the misuse of the tongue. Nor should there be anything in our speech which is, which is deliberately calculated to mislead, it says there. Peter speaks of deceitful speech. Lies, even so-called white lies, are anathema for the Christian. Not least because they never passed the lips of our master, for no deceit, it says, we read back in chapter two, was ever found in his mouth. Then you get to verse 11. Not only are believers' words to be above reproach, but his deeds too, it says, must be blameless. The Christian life is not one of passivity. The priority of God's grace can never be used to deny the need to take action. A life of goodness does not simply happen as believers meditate quietly in their bedrooms. Believers must make a conscious effort to turn from evil that says they must devote themselves to what is good. Jonathan actually touched on this a couple of Wednesdays ago when he emphasized the need to seek God's wisdom. Same idea as here. We're seeking after these things. Now, peace can be easily disrupted, especially when others mistreat or even abuse us. So here, the believer is being told that they must seek and pursue peace. And this peace will only be reserved if believers do not insult and revile others and if they extend forgiveness to others, to those who injure them. That's how they resist the desire not to pursue peace. Pursuing peace means this proactive idea of blessing those who curse. That's how we pursue it. We're going after it. We are, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. That's what we want to do, is we want to be those who are pursuing peace, right? Now, of course, peace without truth isn't really peace, right? We're not talking about laying down the sword of truth. That's not what we do. But man, we just love God so much, we just want to see God's best for every person. That's why we witness to people. We want to see God change their lives. So if we see him raising a ruckus around us, you know, it just rolls right off like water off a duck's back from us and we're just, we're getting to, to the meat of the situation when we talk to someone. You know, have you ever witnessed somebody that just was cussing in your face? <clears throat> and it, sometimes it's a little unsettling when you're trying to witness to somebody and they're just behaving, behaving in a belligerent way and you just look right past it. Look to their heart. Say, Jesus died for you. Now, of course, we have the very profound guidance, and I want to read this before we wrap things up today. We have the very profound profound guidance from the Holy Spirit in Romans 12. How can we look at this in 1 Peter without going and looking at a few verses in Romans 12? It just makes good sense. So let's go to Romans 12 real quick. So remember, I I, I ended a little bit early last week. 
Uh, and so you're getting that part that I ended early with, plus everything else that I had prepared for today. <laughs> so we're going to go a little past, but I'm sure we'll all be fine. Romans 12, we really, man, oh man, if there's a chapter to memorize, right? Romans 12, Romans 12, verse 14. It's like an anthem. Verse 14 says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Quoted that earlier. Be of the same mind toward one another, like-mindedness, there it is again. Do not be haughty in mind. There's that humility thing, right? But associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, now I love the way this is worded, if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. That's what it means to be a peacemaker. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but, excuse me, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what it says, isn't it? Now, of course, I jokingly said, you know, here's how we get back at people or get even with people. I was being a little bit sarcastic there. But uh, there it is right there. The Lord says, you know, vengeance is mine. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And doing this, you're going to heap burning coals on his head. Now, you don't do this because of that, right? You don't say, here, have a glass of water. You know, <laughs> hope that really burns. You know, as young people like to say, ooh, burn. There's a good ooh, burn right there. <clears throat> um, you know, you don't want to do that because you want to pour heaping coals on his head. That's not what this is saying. But you end up doing that because you disarm them. You're not, you're not giving them a reason to want to go back at you, right? You've disarmed the situation. Disarming is always the best, right? Nobody wants to, should want to go to war, right? So if there's, man, if there's anything we can do to resolve this, let's resolve it. Because that obviously brings the most glory to God. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Back to 1 Peter, let's wrap this up. Last verse. Well, last verse we're going to cover today. We can't leave out verse 12, because this is very important, obviously. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So let's remember the situation into which Peter sends this message. This is the way that he says to love life and to see good days, notwithstanding your circumstances, because <clears throat> the Lord has those people in mind. The fact that the Lord's eyes are on us should be sufficient reason for self-restraint under provocation. When I'm in a hostile environment that's, that's working against my Christian faith, I have to remember that whatever action I'm going to take, it always has to be taken with the view that God is watching me. And God has an expectation of me that he probably doesn't have of the person, the non-believer, that might be contending with me. Equally to know that the one who suffered in a similar yet greater way is watching not only makes self-defense unnecessary, but we should be ashamed when we react in the way that we're being told not to react here. Sometimes we, 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 get, a, we get a kick out of it. You know, we've, we've made someone, you got going about, ooh, burn, you know. You say something, some retaliatory, <clears throat> retaliation kind of a thing, and you, you kind of feel good about it, and the fact of the matter is, we shouldn't feel good about it. 
And Peter's major emphasis here in verse 12 is the fact that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous for good and that his ears are attentive to their prayers. And so this is, and it's very interesting too that, that he is attributing here, the Holy Spirit is attributing physical features to a God who is spirit, Jesus said, and what this does is it serves to illustrate the intimacy of our relationship with him. The fact that God sees and hears and knows and there's this bonding that we have with God. And this is the availability that we can go to God at any time. We can pray to God at any time. We have access to God all of the time. And God loves us and he cares for us. But notice it says there that the, the, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, when we enter into prayer, we sometimes refer this to, we refer this to uh, seeking God's face, right? I'm going to seek the face of God. And this is biblical language, which implies that God is turning his face toward us. Now, he always sees us, right? But alternatively, there's also the concept that when God is displeased, he turns his face away. Frequently, don't I pray on Sundays, Lord, let your face shine down upon this meeting today. And so there is that divine disapproval of those who do evil. Now, the original in the psalm, which Peter actually excludes here, in, there's a verse 16, Psalm 34, 16, which adds a determination on God's part to punish the wicked. God is against those who do evil and he will punish them for the evil that they do. We are reminded in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. But then he adds... You've acted foolishly, foolishly in this, and indeed from now on you will surely have wars. That's what it says there. Proverbs 15.3 says that the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. We know that. But then Proverbs 15.8 says that the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. You see the difference there? The wicked carry on. They can even do good deeds. And to God, it's, it's a stench in his nostrils. It is. It, doesn't, it does not please the Lord. But the Bible says the prayer of the upright is his delight. God loves when we approach him. Proverbs 15, 29 says that the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. And so we don't want to... We don't want to break that, right? We don't, want, we don't want God to look disfavorably upon us. We want to make sure that channels are open, right? And so one of the ways we keep those channels open is by doing exactly what 1 Peter is saying here. Now, verse 13, I'm not going to get to this today, but just to look at that very quickly, we're not, not going to unpack it. But it says, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good. Now, the question that's being asked here is based upon the emphasis of the, pre of the section that we just went through. And the question, we'll get to the answer next week, but uh, notice it says that who will harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? In other words, if you prove zealous for doing good, good as defined by God. Not our interpretation of what is good, but what God says is good. And he just gave us a whole list of the things that God says, this is good. This is what I like. This is what pleases me. And the Lord says, if you want to see good life, if you want your life to be blessed, and if you want to have a little snapshot of what's going to be yours in eternity, do these things, the Lord says and you'll be blessed. Have you ever noticed? Bitter people, life isn't good for them, right? You know, 
As I said earlier, the apostles could go through the pain and the trials that they went through and they would testify, no, this is the good life. Paul and Silas in jail after they had received many stripes, it says, and their feet and hands were put in stocks, right? And they sang praises all night. It was the good life. It's always the good life for the Christian because they belong to God. And whatever this world throws at them is only temporal. It's the good life. When we're going through trials, it's still the good life. It's always the good life because we belong to God and we know what's coming. We know what's coming in the future, amen? amen. All right, I'll stop there. I can keep going on, let's stop. Let's stand. <clears throat> I think we get the point, right? Hopefully, we get the point. John MacArthur said, Christians, whether today or in Peter's time, have always had to contend with a hostile world. But they can live humbly, respond to persecution in a Christ-like manner, and adhere to God's standard of authority because they have the promise that even in the midst of trying circumstances, God is watching over them, protecting them, and ready to extend his blessings. End quote. And with that I say, amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for <clears throat> everything that we have just read, Lord. Lord, what a rich, what a rich time that is reading through those passages, God. And Lord, we pray that you would do that work in our hearts that only you can do. Because we recognize, we recognize the world can't walk this way. They may try to take a high road, Lord, but they fail miserably. And Lord, we understand that we can actually walk this way because of new birth, because of renewed hearts, renewed minds. And so, Lord, we, we do understand that there is that process of sanctification, Lord, where our minds are renewed and yet need to be renewed. And so, Lord, we want to walk with you and we want to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. And we ask that you would fulfill that in us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. and amen. God bless you guys.